Here is one of a series of talks by spiritual leader Lola McDowell Lee, spanning two decades from the early 70s through the 90s. Lola was a Zen Roshi, whose Rinzai lineage included Dr. Henry Plutov and renowned Zen master Shigetsu Sasaki. Lola was a religious scholar as well as an ordained Christian minister. While the talks are focused mainly on Zen and Buddhism, Lola drew on many spiritual traditions, including those of Jesus, Plato, Lao Tzu, the Hindu Vedas, Meister Eckhart, and Gurdjieff. All beings... <laughs> really? All beings from the very beginning are Buddhas. It is like water and ice. Apart from water, no ice. Outside living beings, no Buddhas. Not knowing it is near, they seek it afar. What a pity. It is like one in the water who cries out for thirst. It is like the child of a rich house who has strayed away among the poor. The cause of our circling through the six worlds is that we are on the dark paths of ignorance. Dark path upon dark path treading. When shall we escape from birth and death? The Zen meditation of the Mahayana is beyond all praise. Giving and morality and the other perfections, taking of the name, repentance, discipline, and the many other right actions all come back to the practice of meditation. By the merit of a single sitting, he destroys innumerable accumulated sins. How should there be wrong paths for him? Yeah. Well, this is the first part or the first half of Hakuin's Song of Meditation. And Hakuin, as you may know, lived uh, in from 1695 to 1768. And he is known as the father of a modern Rinzai Zen. Yeah. Uh, at the time when he was a Roshi, uh, Zen in Japan still had a very Chinese flavor and it was very much on the decline. And if he had not come along and been what he was, it's pretty hard to tell what the fate of Zen would have been. Yeah? Yeah. But this monk, <clears throat> before he became a Roshi, this Hakuin, uh, he, uh, <clears throat> you know, he had his thoughts. And uh, he thought he knew to good purpose, as they say. And so one summer evening, he presented his viewpoints to his teacher, who was the venerable Shoju. And this evening, why this venerable shoju happened to be sitting on the veranda there by the, at the, at the temple. <clears throat> and so here is Hakuin going on with all this stuff that he thinks he knows about, you know, and finally the teacher says, stuff and nonsense, you know. And Hakuin, <clears throat> you know, being at the state where he was, he echoed very loudly and very satirically, Stuff and nonsense. Hmm? So this Roshi, being a good Roshi, <laughs> grabbed him and struck him several times and pushed him off the porch. Hmm? Now it had been raining. Hmm? Does a lot of that in Japan in June, I understand. Almost the whole month of June it rains, you know, and then it gets humid, miserable. Hmm? 
And this poor monkey just rolled over into the mud. <clears throat> but after a while, he collected himself. And he went again to the veranda. Here he is now, all covered with mud and everything. And uh, he bowed. To which this teacher now replied, Oh, you denizen of the dark caverns! And Hakuin well left, but he felt, you know, that his teacher didn't really know how deep his intuition of Zen really was, you know. He just, teacher just didn't understand. See? And decided that someday he would have a settlement with him. Yeah. So another day, then he goes to see him again. And he exhausted all his ingenuity in contest with him. Huh? And he wasn't going to give an inch. And the teacher wasn't going to give an inch. But this Akwe knew he was right. <laughs> but again, you know, this master was furious. And again, he took a hold of Hakuin and gave him several slaps, and he pushed him off the porch again. And there was a stone wall right there, and this time Hakuin, in this fall, rolled up against the stone wall, and he was almost senseless. It really knocked him out. And the Roshi looked down at him, and he laughed, which brought Hakuin back to consciousness. And then the Roshi yelled at him again, Oh, you denizen of the dark caverns! Well, poor little Hawkeen was now desperate. <laughs> Nobody understood him. <laughs> His teacher, who was supposed to understand everything, just didn't understand him. But he continued his duties as a monk. And so one day he went out, you know, begging in the village. And in this trip, why, he came to a house where an old woman refused to give him any rice. And he continued just to stand there in front of the house. And it looked to her, it appeared, you know, as if he had not heard the refusal. But actually his mind was intensely concentrated on the subject which concerned him most. <clears throat> anyway, this woman got very angry at his apparent persistence, and she struck him with a broom she was using and told him to get out. This heavy broom smashed his large hat, and it knocked him to the ground. And he lay there for a while, and then suddenly, suddenly, eh, everything became very clear and very transparent to him. And he ran back to the temple in all oh, this joy that he had. Huh? And before he crossed, or just as he was crossing the gate, the master saw him, and recognized him, and he said, Oh, what good news have you brought back today? Come right in, quick, quick, you have it now, you have it now. Isn't that a nice story about him? Yeah. Anyway, this ha queen became the keeper of a deserted temple in Suruga, <clears throat> and it was, it, was a, well, it was a scene of desolation, it was a scene of dilapidation, now, there were no roofs, so the stars shone in at night, and there was no floor. See, on rainy days, it was necessary to put on a rain hat and a pair of the high getta, you know, so, you know, walk around, keep out of the mud. The property was in the hands of the creditors, and all the furnishings were mortgaged. That's how he started. This was the beginning of Hakuin's career as a Roshi. In this lineage of Hakuin, <clears throat> We find the great Shogatsu, Sokeyan, Ruth Fuller Sasaki, <clears throat> Muri Roshi, Dr. Plaroff. <laughs> How's that? Well, so are all of you. Huh? You got something to live up to. Boy more ways than one. Now, how queen's approach <clears throat> to yourself uh, is, uh, let us call it, come and see. Hmm? He doesn't say come and believe. He, it's, Come and see. 
when you have seen, you know, there's no need to believe anymore, is there? No. Because when you see, your eyes are open. Otherwise, how could you see? The practice of meditation is the art of opening the eyes. Hmm? It is the art of dropping the dust that has gathered on this mirror of consciousness. Naturally, most naturally, dust gathers. But we don't need to pile it on like we do, do we? No, I don't think so. We should be trying to wipe it clean. Hmm? Don't cling to the dust. You know, sometimes it's as if we were stuck, you know, to this dust. Mostly desire, huh? We're stuck to this desire with the glue of greed. Hmm. What is your desire? Understand your desire. In the understanding of desire, now desire itself, you know, desire ceases. And suddenly, when desire ceases, when all of a sudden, for, even for a flash, you are free of desire, there is this new feeling of being. We should know about desire, what it is, and why do you hanker. <clears throat> also, we should know what consciousness is. Here we sit here in the dust looking for reality. Or we're looking for someone to come and save us. Or we're looking for some kind of a golden wand to bring us out of our slumber. We look for something other. And we project a paradise somewhere. And paradise is already here. You know, Adam never really left the garden. He just didn't recognize it anymore. He covered it over with dust. Yeah. <clears throat> no consciousness. Huh? Then you will know that you cannot divide consciousness. Consciousness is not two. Consciousness is indivisible. You can't say ordinary consciousness against enlightened consciousness. Hmm? Enlightened consciousness is ordinary consciousness. Ordinary consciousness is enlightened consciousness. So then you right away you ask, well, what's the matter with me then? You know, we're up, 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 If ordinary consciousness is enlightened consciousness, why am I not enlightened? No. Well, are you conscious? Well, there, somebody once said it's axiomatic, of course. <laughs> hmm? I'm conscious. Well, you are objectively self-conscious. And that's not consciousness per se. Right? There's a difference. Somebody read with me. You're conscious? Show me. You point to that consciousness. Yeah? Show me. Where is that consciousness? We believe in consciousness. Now, and this very belief prevents us from becoming totally conscious. Thusly do we deceive ourselves. What well, can you tell me about consciousness? Consciousness, I'll tell you, consciousness has one factor, hmm? it is aware. It is aware. 
It is not aware of the past. It is not aware of the future. It is not aware of the other world. The moment that you exist in this moment, you are conscious. <clears throat> now, Fusho, Fusho in Zen means unproduced, which means you cannot produce the consciousness of enlightenment. You can't produce consciousness, period. Hmm. I'd like to see you do it. <laughs> hmm. It is unproduced, fusho. Huh? When you have wiped the dust off the mirror, there is this state of non-doing. And then all of a sudden, in this silence, in this stillness of non-doing, there is a transformation. Zenists say it is nothing special. How can it be special? It is everybody's nature. You may know, you may not know, and therein lies a difference, but you have it. It's there, it's here, and it's waiting, and it's waiting, and it's waiting, and it's waiting, and it's waiting for you to come and see. And fushi means no fuss. It doesn't fuss. It doesn't regard itself as something special. It just is. Wushi. Hmm. Yeah. Now, all sentient beings are from the very beginning Buddhas. You have never been otherwise. And not in all your joys and not in all your anguish. Have you been ever been otherwise? You cannot really move away from that Buddhahood or Godhood, if you wish. God is involved in everything, everything you say and everything you do, in every being. Uh, the English word being hmm, comes from a Sanskrit root, bu, B-H-U. Hmm? And that means to the effect that which grows. All that grows is God. All that grows is Buddha. Trees grow, birds grow, we grow and everything grows at its own pace. That which breathes, you know, the universe, that which breathes, that which grows, that which has life, however rudimentary, however primitive, everything is included. All sentient beings are from the very beginning Buddha. <clears throat> but a Buddha is one, <clears throat> it is a consciousness that has come to itself. It is no more wandering around in the dust. It is no more groveling in the dust. It is no more trying to possess the dust. And this consciousness is not possessed by memories nor the imagination. That consciousness is now. And now it is awake, it is alert, and it is radiant. Always it is radiant. Yeah. <clears throat> All beings are Buddha. 
You know, Zenas call this sentence Hakwin's Lion's Roar. Hmm. Bodhidharma had his, you know, with the tree grows in the garden. And then his, I don't know. Hmm. Rinzai had his quats. Hakwin, all beings are Buddha. You know, a lion's roar that comes from, as he put it, the goat. Huh? A lion roaring in one single roar, one single sound, one single stroke. You have saved yourself from yourself. You are a Buddha. But you are not a Buddha in any special sense. Everybody is. Your dog and your cat and your donkey if you've got one and your horse and your cow if you've got them, you know. Your birds. Yeah. So don't take this in any egotistical sense. Oh, I'm a Buddha, you know. Look at me, I'm a Buddha. You're far away, what a pity, huh? And don't make it ambitious. You know, don't go on a spiritual trip with it. Oh, I'm a Buddha. I can do anything. Huh? Life is Buddha. Existence is Buddhahood. We are also indebted to Ha Queen for the great koan, you know, what is the sound of one hand? Mm, this is the sound of two hands. What is the sound of one hand? His invitations to come and see, come and see, come and see. Hmm? We, in this illusory world, and the Buddhas in the world of <coughs> realization are from the beginning one, not two. To know this oneness, this unity, hmm, is called awakening. Man awakes himself and realizes the three bodies of Buddha. There is the body of truth, the body of bliss, and the body of manifestation. Yeah. The essence and the form and the action. It is like water and ice. Hmm? Apart from water, no ice. Outside living be beings, no Buddhas. You know, ice is, after all, fundamentally water, isn't it? Ice is water. Apart from water, there's no ice. There can't be any ice if there isn't any water. When water, when it's exposed to the cold, freezes, it gets hard. And though its nature doesn't change, hmm, it loses its freedom of movement. Yeah. Through our ignorance, <clears throat> we get set and we harden. We have our habit patterns. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And though the essence, <coughs> hmm, the essential does not change, we have barred ourselves from a limitless freedom. A human being <coughs> set and hardened by ignorance is still a Buddha. Hmm? But it is the rigidity of our mind that causes our troubles. And our minds are set in these habit patterns. Hmm? Three bodies the trimorti, huh? <clears throat> the three faces of God. 
the physical, well, we could compare that to the ice, huh? And then we have the water, the liquidity, or the psyche, and then there is the vaporous. Hmm? Now, ice is to melt into water, and the water is to evaporate. The essence is to be extracted from the frozen, and the essence is to be extracted then from the liquid. Yeah? Ice has definition. It has boundaries. Water has no definition. It really doesn't have any boundaries. You can pour water into any jug or into any pot, and it takes the shape of the pot. Hmm? It is non-resistant. It is non-aggressive. It doesn't fight. It adjusts. And the essence is the sky. Hmm? Yeah, it's vast. And it's empty. Three states of water. Three states of consciousness. The first body going this way, this way now. Essence. The second is form. And the third is action. People who live in this body, this third body, they live in doing. What to do? What to do? What not to do? What not to do? What to do? What not to do? Hmm? In the body of form, the individual begins to glimpse something of non-action. And it happens in meditation. Sometimes you're sitting silently, nothing to do, and all of a sudden this great joy rises. You know? Whence cometh this joy? Hmm? No cause. But it is as if a vapor had taken form, huh? miraculously, magically, you know. It's form now. And now, in our activity, in our action, we label it. And we label it joy. He doesn't care what you call it. No. But then, if you keep moving within, you know, and follow that joy to its source, then you can reach the essence, which is the body of truth. Yeah. And here there is no action and there is no no action. It is the essence of existence. And you have not gone anywhere to find it, you know, <clears throat> because you've been carrying it all along. Yeah. Not knowing it is near, they seek it afar. What a pity. It is like one in the water who cries out for thirst. It is like the child of a rich house who has strayed away among the poor. You know, Jesus said to the effect, come and see, and you will have a life more abundant. You will have the life abundant, huh? which people interpret as getting more and more and more of your desires fulfilled. That is abundant to them, huh? Yeah. They've got more money, more land, more power, whatever you desire, you know, whatever you are greedy for. But never looking at the desire itself. You know, see this desire in yourself. See it until, and look at it until you understand it. See? And then you just possess yourself, and when you possess yourself, you possess all. After all, you know. Hmm? Possessing things, we remain beggars. You know, we get one thing, and then we get tired of it, and we throw it away, and then we get another thing, and another thing, and another thing, and another thing. And there are those who uh, get tired of this, and so they want to possess otherworldly things. <clears throat> what has changed? Nothing. Hmm? 
Only the form of the desire. One person wants to possess money, uh, you know, and the other person wants to possess righteousness. Not much different. Hmm? The underlying element, the desire, you know, this greed to have hasn't been touched. It hasn't been dealt with. Greed is greed no matter what it's greedy for. Hmm? But the seeing, yeah, the seeing, yeah, that brings the change. Seeing brings the transformation. And until then, we are in the water crying for a drink. The cause of our circling through the dust, through the six worlds is that we are on the dark paths of ignorance. Dark path upon dark path treading. When shall we escape from birth and death? Well, the six worlds I've explained previously, huh? is the wheel of life, you know, we picture a wheel of life and there are these spokes in this wheel. Uh, and then these are the realms then with which we identify. There's the realm of the gods and from that we go to anguish hell, huh? The realms of force and strife, the asuras they're called, and we have the realms of the realm of uncontrollable passions and instincts and the ignorance of the undeveloped mind. There is an animal-like state called the Preta world. We have restlessness, unsatisfied passions, and then there is the man state, which is an activity with purpose. And it is this state that has the higher aspirations to this other realm, which is called God. Hmm? Round and around and around and around and around and around and around we go. That's called the wheel of samsara. And we're going around in the vidya, in our ignorance, dark path upon dark path treading. Lao Tzu, you know, he says, what is at the center of the wheel? That's what's important. What is that that the wheel revolves around? Is that center not more important than going around and around and around? I would think so. It is the understanding of what we are about. It is the understanding of our desire. It is understanding the realm we are in at any given moment. Do you understand where you are right now? No. It is understanding our selfishness. It is understanding our greediness. It is understanding our egotism. It is the understanding. And it must be more than a mental understanding. Understand. To understand is to come and see. <clears throat> Once upon a time, One time there were three little pigs. <laughs> Once upon a time, uh, there dwelt an old king in a palace. <clears throat> and uh, in, he had a big foyer. And the only thing in this foyer was a golden table. And there on the table was shining a magnificent jewel. <clears throat> and as time went along, the jewel sparkled more and more and more. It was a fabulous stone, you know. One day, a thief stole it, and he ran from the palace and he hid in the forest. And he sat there with this jewel, and he had such joy in possessing this. And he's sitting there looking at it, and all of a sudden the image of the king is in this stone, is in this jewel. 
and the king speaks to him. It's a marvelous jewel. We should all have one of these. And the king says, I have come to thank you. You have released me from my attachment. I thought I was freed when I acquired this jewel. But I learned that I could be released only when I passed it on. Each day of my life, I polished this stone until this day, and now I have passed it on, and I am released. The jewel that you hold is understanding. You cannot add to its beauty by hiding it or by hinting that you have it. You cannot add to it by wearing it with vanity. Its beauty comes of the consciousness that others have of it. Honor that which gives it beauty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Zen meditation of the Mahayana is beyond all our praises. Giving and morality and the other perfections, taking of the name, repentance, discipline, and the many other right actions, all come back to the practice of meditation. Now, this giving and morality and the other perfections are the paramitas. Huh? And I've talked about them before in the Noble Eightfold Path and the Twelvefold Chain of Causation, and we're not going to go into it today. <laughs> no. You don't want to sit here that long, I'm sure. No. I know you don't. Okay, first we begin by becoming aware of the physical body. You watch yourself when you're walking. You watch yourself when you're eating. You watch yourself when you're running. You watch yourself when you're talking. You watch yourself when you're listening. You watch yourself when you're working. You watch. It's a good occupation. You watch. You will finally come to see that this body is part of the world. Yeah? Watch it. It's not separate. Then through watching, you will see that something is watching. In this instance, not you. Not you, you. Huh? Other you. Big you. <laughs> Seeing you. See you. <laughs> Something watches. That watcher cannot be watched. The observer cannot be observed. The seer cannot be seen. The knower cannot be known. But you can be that. The pure witness is just that beingness. How Queen and all the others before him and all the others after him say that it happens through meditation? Why should I say anything different? <laughs> huh? Through meditation you will rediscover what you are. I like it, you know. Meditation is nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the merit of a single sitting, he has destroyed innumerable accumulated sin. How should there be wrong paths for him? See, this is Zen. It's not a gradual path. You try this path and you try that path, and but you sit and sudden, there it is. Hmm? It happens in a single moment. It can happen now. Are you watching? If you postpone until tomorrow, who knows? Tomorrow may never come. Yeah? Actually, it never comes. Huh? It doesn't. It's always now, isn't it? Tomorrow is a thought in your head. Yesterday is a thought in your head. What is today? 
When to tomorrow comes, it's today. Tomorrow never comes. What are you waiting for? Hmm? If the awareness is lucid and it's clear, then this very sitting, no one is barring the gate. No one is hindering you except yourself. Come and see. Hmm? Come and see. <clears throat> now, uh, <clears throat> repressions. Let's do use that word. We all have them. Yep. You didn't get this far without them. Barking up the wrong tree if you think you haven't got them. We operate through our repressions. Right now, listening through our repressions. Yeah? But maybe we could say with St. Paul, now I set aside childish things, for I am become a man. Just to be a man is enough. You don't need to be a saint, because if you're going to be a saint, you're going to have a need to be a sinner. Be a man. Be natural. Don't interfere with your true nature. Don't try to mold it into a pattern. Don't hanker to be somebody else or something else. Just relax into yourself. Be yourself. Hmm? It all comes back to the practice of meditation. Uh, Tanyu, there was a man by the name of Tanyu, and he was an artist. And he was the one that painted the dragon on the ceiling of the main hall, the big hondo at the temple of Myoshinji. Hmm? You've all heard of that place. His masterpiece is one of the art treasures of the world. Now, a long time ago, what is it, 300 years ago or something like that, at the time that he was to paint it, there was a, a master gudo in charge of Myoshinji. And uh, he had heard that the dragons that Tanyu painted were very realistic. Now, a dragon, you know, <coughs> the Chinese, you know, also had this thing with the dragons, uh, the dragon with a pearl in its mouth, signifying he's found it, huh? Dragons. Nice dragons. And Tanyu could paint them very realistically. So he went, the Master Gudo went to see this artist, and he said to him, for this very special occasion, you know, this Myoshinji was going to last a long time, big thing, you know, for this very special occasion, I particularly want to have the painting of the dragon done from life. <laughs> and naturally, this artist was very taken aback, you know. And he says, well, this is most unexpected. You know, as a matter of fact, I'm ashamed to say, I have never seen a living dragon. You know? And so he wanted to refuse the commission. But this Roshi, however, agreed that it would be unreasonable to expect a painting of a living dragon from an artist who had never seen one. And so he told him to try to have a look, to look at one as soon as he could. You go look at one as soon as you can, huh? Sure. To which Tanyu answered, well, where can one see a living dragon? You know, where do they live? Where does one find a living dragon? You know? Oh, that's nothing. That's nothing. At my place, there are any number. <laughs> <laughs> Come and see. At my place, there are any number. Come and see. Then you paint. Huh? Oh, so this artist, he joyfully goes along with the Roshi, you know, and they come to the Zendo, and he, you know, he says, well, I'm here to see the dragons. Where are they? <laughs> hmm? Where are my dragons? <laughs> Uh, and the Roshi lets his gaze go around the room at the monks, and he says, plenty of them here. Hmm? Can't you see them? 
What a pity. Huh? Oh, and the artist was so sad. He was so overcome with regret. You know, he couldn't see these dragons. All these monks sitting here, but he couldn't see any dragons. So he decided that he would spend some time with the monks so he too could see the dragons. <clears throat> and he spent two years in meditation and he practiced what they called assiduously. Hmm? And one day something happened and he rushed in to see this Roshi and he says, by your grace, I have today seen the form of a living dragon. Oh, have you? Good. And Gudo, being the good teacher that he was, immediately asked the next question. Now tell me, what does his roar sound like? Hmm? Yeah. Well, as the story goes, this man, this artist, he sat for another year, and then he painted the dragon. And it is renowned for more than its technique, but for the life that is infused in it. Huh? The lion's roar is in it. Have you heard it? Huh? Have you seen the dragon? Come and see. Come and see. I want to read you the whole Hakuin song of meditation, and then we will go. <clears throat> All sentient beings are from the very beginning Buddhas. It is like water and ice. Apart from water, no ice. Outside living beings, no Buddhas. <clears throat> Not knowing it is near, they seek it afar. What a pity. It is like the child of a rich house who has strayed away among the poor. The cause of our circling through the six worlds is that we are on the dark paths of ignorance. Dark path <coughs> upon dark path treading. When shall we escape from birth and death? The Zen meditation of the Mahayana is beyond all our praise. Giving and morality and the other perfections, taking of the name, repentance, discipline, and the many other right actions all come back to the practice of meditation. By the merit of a single sitting, he destroys innumerable accumulated sins. How should there be wrong paths for him? The pure land paradise is not far. When in reverence this truth is heard even once, he who praises it and gladly embraces it has merit without end. How much more he who turns within and confirms directly his own nature, that his own nature is no nature. Such has transcended vain words. The gate opens. Cause and effect are one. Straight runs away. Not two, not three. Taking as form the form of no form. Going or returning, he is ever at home. Taking as thought the thought of no thought. Singing and dancing, all is a voice of truth. Wise is the heaven of the boundless samadhi. Radiant the full moon of the fourfold wisdom. What remains to be sought? Nirvana is clear before him. This very place, the lotus paradise, this very body, Buddha. Now, may the peace and the power that passeth all understanding hold us and keep us in the love of the Christed consciousness while we are seemingly separate one from another.
and I thank you very much. If you find Lola's talks valuable, more will be posted in weeks to come.